I'm Dmitry Zaika. Uh, a couple of words about me. Uh, I have a background in mathematical and theoretical physics. I worked in one of the top Russian tech companies, leading data teams and doing some technical product management there. And uh, two years ago, I moved here in San Francisco and to work in biotech, an aging longevity biotech company. And uh, today I will share my uh, experience, like kind of merge of my experience from tech and what I've seen in biotech and uh, what I'm seeing right now is an opportunity uh, in context of general AI. So uh, the official, like I, I would like to change a little bit like official name of the, my presentation. Uh, so, and I will explain later what do I mean here. So, um, this presentation is quite fresh, so like there will be, it won't be very beautiful. Uh, the image score will be low, so uh, let's just start. Um, so the main question I want to ask here is basically, um, like I will explain it right now. So here we can see like a general schema of what's going on, what, what a machine that produces therapies which um, my, regarding my personal interests, like those therapies could help us to like live longer life, potentially indefinitely. Uh, but the, uh, so I can explain a little bit, we get some kind of money inflow, we have innovation pipeline and value pipeline. I will, exp um, let's say that value pipeline is more like a big pharma companies. So it's like, like, established flow of producing new drugs on the market um, with known, kind of known technologies, kind of known approaches. Uh, and the innovation pipeline is more about like inventing new technologies, new like uh, ways to do things. So the problem here is that uh, this thing is very slow. I mean, it's, uh, it, it takes lots of money, like $2 billion per successful like drug on the market, like only 50 like maybe drugs per year is being approved. So it's like major discoveries that can, um, I don't know, like considerably extend our lifespan is very rare. So the, pro the question is like, can we kind of improve uh, the efficiency? So I'm not talking about bringing more money or more energy in this system. There are different like organizations that do this, like, I don't know, like one of those in, uh, on my, like, it's called vitalism, for example. Uh, it involves like political, social change, or like another type of organization is Longevity Biotech Fellowship. Um, they're trying to create some kind of roadmap that will uh, help, uh, you know, like attract more money into uh, mainly innovation pipeline, I would say. So I'm focusing more on this efficiency, so like on the efficiency of the engine. Uh, and uh, ask the question, can we like, you know, significantly improve it? Like 10X is just, I saw some cases that like do it, but maybe it's 100 when some emergent behavior will happen, I don't know. So, um, and uh, I will talk about that and how generative AI is kind of like, probably will help us. So, few important concepts before I move further. Uh, one would be like a concept of a process. I, I would argue that it's enough for us to, to, to state that uh, like a working horse of every enterprise, independent, like is it biotech or anything else, is like uh, lots of cycles of people engaging in some kind of workflows, they're doing some kind of tasks, using some kind of tools to achieve some organizational goals. So here's the, just an example. Uh, you can say that it's scientists and computational scientists, so it's a very simplified flow of, you might say, preclinical development in drug, um, in drug development. Uh, just like I will explain. So for example, you have to train some machine learning models to score targets for your therapy. So basically the you know, molecules inside your organism that you need to like, in, with, with which you need to intervene somehow in order to, you know, uh, uh, cure some disease, then uh, scientists, regular scientists have to do some kind of literature review, understand what are those targets, uh, 
like how, how are they particularly involved in the disease, kind of score them further. Uh, and they use some tools. You can see that like, first, like computational science use some kind of like machine learning, you know, uh, coding tools. So then the scientists have to use some search through literature, use some like Google Sheets, or any other kinds of tools. Then uh, it goes back to the computational scientists who need to run some simulation, for example, to find a small molecule that interacts with this target well. Um, and then they go, it go back to the scientists. The scientists have to do like some experiments in the lab and hopefully after, this is very simplified, so after some like lots of iterations um, and like side quests, it goes to like like success, which is the goal here. It's like, okay, we have a drug candi candidate that we can test in humans now. Um, that's just an example. Uh, and the second concept would be process improvement. So this is a kind of like history of this concept that I see it. So um, we, we are still not talking even like about biotech. It's like general thing. So uh, I would say like in 90s, like beginning of the century, it was, there was a notion like a business process management approach. So basically people kind of starting to systematically um, uh, kind of investigate what, what, what's actually happening in the, in the company, who is doing what, like how to optimize this thing. Um, so go into like the, the model those processes, they kind of uh, monitor them, they find some opportunities to optimize it. So it's a, like a framework. Um, um, another notion, another um, concept here is hyper automation, which was in the original name of my uh, talk. I would say that it's like a business process management, but like like on steroids or something. So you kind of add robotics, you kind of add advanced tools like robotics, uh, machine learning uh, tools, apps, code. so you, you try to, to make more digital uh, and uh, automate uh, every part of the process as you can. Uh, and another like even more vague, um, so those two things are kind of established, I guess, Business process management is like classics, like hyper automation is some kind of hype, I would say, right now in recent years. And autonomous enterprise is kind of like, we don't know what's that, but here's the first, you, you, uh, like first mention of generative AI on the slides, actually, because I generated this picture. So, uh, like, basically, the idea that can we create companies that mostly autonomous and like don't need like lots of employers and lots of things are done by uh, AI. So, uh, and it's like happening right now, who knows where it goes, but it's kind of like a natural way of uh, flowing, th things flowing, you know, in into the future. So, so what is the claim of this talk? Um, I would say that there is like this natural flow from classic enterprise to autonomous enterprise, which is maybe like some kind of unicorn, but anyway, it's like a, it's like a goal, autonomous enterprise, and it's done by those practices like business process management, so like identifying those processes, refining them, automating them, uh, until you like don't need people anymore, uh, which is hyper automation, and Generative AI kind of like fits well into this toolbox, and I will explain later how. So this is the like t top thing, and I would say that it's kind of um, maps onto the well-known notions of like what's biotech and tech bio. Tech bio is like more, I would say it's biotech with more like using more advanced tools, uh, robotics, AI, and stuff. And the term that I just invented, like to differentiate um, those things, which I call deep tech bio, you can call it like autonomous biotech. Um, so I will explain. Uh, yeah. So 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 basically, this this process, uh, which is a general process in the any kind of industry, maps onto the biotechnology in, into this way. Um, so let's see some cases from biotechnology, actually. So I will explain, there's like two opportunities here. One opportunity is when you, actually I come from tech company to biotech, so I saw some differences and that's kind of like insight I had. So basically that 
that if you look in at tech companies and biotech companies, they are a little bit different. I argue that mainly because of the like structure of their work, you like tech companies, they have like a like consumer phase, they have fast cycles, they revenue generate and they have low margins, uh, which, which basically brings that those companies have to be operationally effective. So uh, because otherwise they go from the market. So uh, R&D companies can kind of like, you know, um, uh, slack a little bit, I guess in this area, they, they focus on science. So, um, Tech companies uh, and consumer face companies, I would say, in general, they developed lots of practices, tools, and frameworks during these years. Uh, like from, you saw this business process management things that I mentioned before. And uh, there is like an opportunity to transfer those things like low hanging fruits. You can just go see what, what tech companies are doing like and enter some like average biotech companies see that they throw Excel files through email and like sometimes don't know what, what, what who is and what. So uh, you can like, just take things from tech and, and bring it. So that's the first opportunity. The second is like, why do we need humans uh, at all? Like they're good at moving things and they're good at like uh, making decisions. So we can see that robotics kind of should solve the problem of moving things and uh, advanced analytics in like previous ages uh, was, do, was more responsible for making decisions. And uh, right now with Gen AI, we can do much more. Uh, so let's focus on two. I, I will talk about two cases, which I'm directly uh, uh, experienced. So, um, uh, and we focus on drug development. So drug development is like simplified version of drug development is that we have to understand the disease uh, in order to like what we what, what exactly do we want to like intervene with inside your organism then we have to design the drug like design the intervention that will kind of you know do the job uh, and then after that when we kind of validate it in lots of different like non-human models we have to validate it in humans and prove that everything is okay. So I won't talk about this third thing, which is clinical trials. They're highly regulated. There are, lo there are lots of opportunities also, but it's like a, a little bit different world. So I will talk about this uh, first two stages. So uh, let's talk about the stage of understanding the disease. And I the case of the BioH Labs company. Um, it's a drug development company, uh, like fighting age-related diseases. Uh, it's a pretty big company with hundreds of millions of investments. It has a very successful potential drug in the phase two right now, uh, pharma, collaborations with pharma. Uh, so uh, I will use this company a, a, as an example. So first of all, it like it uses computational biology heavily. So it's already kind of like, I would say tech bio company. So it's, it's, it's not just, you know, people like moving stuff in the labs, you know. So it, uh, yeah, so it's already, already advanced um, in this regard. But like, uh, what if we add some practices from um, things that, that generally you can go to any kind of tech company and uh, successful tech company and see that they are doing, they have some kind of infrastructure uh, which is called data ops here. So you have to have some data platforms. You have to some practice of development, um, agile development. You have to control for quality, and also you have to this to have this uh, culture of kind of developing internal products for your and constantly optimizing the workflow of your employees. So if we add those things, um, what it will enable us to do. So basically, uh, it brings us the opportunity to create some s solutions like this. So this is like just the use case. So we can create, for example, a Gen AI powered data pipeline, which will result in like before that, uh, you had like a postdoc to review literature for like a week or something. Um, when you choose target, for example, you have to understand you not choose the target, but when, when you choose like some kind of long list of targets that you uh, wanna focus later, you have to review lots of literature, what evidence are there in this literature, like for this target, be important for this disease and stuff like that. 
So you, you give this task for a postdoc and it like goes for a week and, uh, and hopefully returns with something. And if you implement this kind of solution, so you just like basically generative AI, like with ChatGPT, like just review the papers and uh, this postdoc just screens them uh, in a specific like no code app, for example, that you developed for him or her. Uh, and like in two hours, it gets some like a like short list uh, instead of weeks. So uh, I like highlighted powered here. So it's it's the use case of using generative AI as a tool, as a like a sp tool for specific task. In this kind of um, uh, situation, it's a literature review basically. You have lots of those tasks on, on, during the um, you know uh, operations of your company. So that's generative AI for specific tasks. In some sense, it's it's like it's like the more advanced. Like you, you previously also had lots of those tools. You had some kind of machine learning model, or even like a dashboard, like just filter table. So it's it's more it, it's like this. So uh, another use case that I will uh, talk about uh, is. Uh, um, like, I will highlight the, the role of generative AI, like separate role. Like, I think it's like it's like different role that um, uh, maybe over being overseen right now. But it's kind of I feel it's a trend, and I will explain later what the trend is. So uh, the case would be about the next stage, which is drug design, and I will use the. Uh, example of the company which is like it's not so successful company as Baish, of course but it's like a, it's like a small company that's trying to like become a tech bio uh, company right now and um, they have a simple service in terms of like you have a drug target uh, um, uh, like biology is being solved and uh, and then you have to design the molecule which is optimized uh, according to some requirements of the you know customer so they already have this you know computational chemistry very heavily like like in, uh, invested in computational chemistry they have uh, ml ops so all kinds of infrastructure that's usually been done in the um, tech companies they have internal product development practices because they have a team of developers. They have like a product manager who works with them, like in sprints and stuff like that. Um, so they are already kind of a tech bio company, I would argue. But uh, what if you like add this notion of AI scientists, which I will explain after that. So that's like a generative AI secret sauce, which is different from previous use case, which was just using generative AI to like as a tool, right? So if we add this thing, um, we now can get like generative AI, like orchestrated computational pipeline. So basically now computational chemists only have to like review and approve like end-to-end -end process. Like this thing kind of orchestrates everything. Sometimes it like wants to involve the human in the loop. It gives a task to this chemist. It like screens to the thing, approves, okay or needs like some or edit this thing. So it's a different type of workflow. It's not like uh, using generative AI for a specific task. In that sense, generative AI is not that different from any other like previous approaches. Okay, it's more advanced, it can solve some different use cases. It's the usage of the generative AI as a basically like, yeah, like an orchestrating decision making uh, and solving end-to-end -end tasks. So that's the difference. End-to-end uh, -end process, even like not not a task. So um, what is this AI scientist? And then I, that's that would be like a, uh, I would say main thing of my talk. So like I will explain to you what what is this trend as I feel it, and um, uh, how it can help us to you know to make the this machine you know more effective so um, I would say that history of this um, thing is like this so first we have like a proof of concept ironically the first system was named Adam uh, and it's a uh, it's even have a, like a Wikipedia page which is called robot scientist so it's pretty uh, it was the first system that um, 
showed that you can that that, that that it's capable of producing some scientific discovery independent from like humans. Uh, it was like a specific, you know, constrained uh, environment, specific task. But anyway, it's like a first uh, use case, case proof of concept. Then I call this kind of maturation of concept. So it's uh, um, for now I can kind of feel that it's due to one guy who kind of uh, like was pushing this question, can we create a system that wins the Nobel Prize, for example? Like, nobody will know, like, like, like Satoshi Nakamoto, I don't know, like, they, somebody published a paper and then they learned that it's not a human or like a system. Um, and then there was like enabler, I would say, so there was like a lot of theory behind that, then there was the enabler which it claim is like ChatGPT, like generative AI re revolution or something, how do you call it? And then, Right after that, you can see the proliferation of different approaches, systems that people are trying to implement in, like, in academia, but also you can see companies that are trying to use it. So, the proof of concept, it was like, um, yeah, Adam the robot scientist, it was like an autom automated autonomous lab for specific task that was capable of doing the whole scientific cycle of generating hypotheses, uh, testing the hypothesis in this lab, then analyzing the results, adjusting the plan, testing again until it kind of got f found some uh, several I don't know, I don't remember like the like kind of proteins involved in some process. So this was like a scientific discovery, a small scientific discovery. Um, there was a second robot which is called Eve, uh, but anyway. <laughs> um, Okay, so the, the next stage is like concept maturation. I would say that it's like uh, this guy, uh, well, he's credible, like he's like Sony and in Sony, works in Sony, is a AI and, and computer science executive. He also is a head of Systems Biology Institute in Japan uh, and he's professor, well, pretty much established institution, institute there. So um, he was kind of, uh, also he's a robotics pioneer. So he, like before it was cool, uh, it's like those robots playing football and like dogs, probably you've seen them, so this is the guy. And um, uh, what he did, like kind of like pushed this agenda for several years, for several publications, like, okay, can we just go and win a Nobel Prize with the thing? Like, uh, can we create an agent, uh, engine for the scientific discovery? Autonomous scientific discovery. Uh, they that it, it led to some kind of formulation, some kind of challenge. Let's let's solve this problem until like 2050 or something. Uh, even like Turing Institute, which he's kind of involved in, I guess, uh, also have a challenge of AI scientists grand challenge. So it's kind of this thing became on the map of like academic circles, I would say. And then, uh, yeah, if, I, if you I want to summarize, like, in a couple of slides, what is he arguing about? It's like, basically, he's saying, okay, there's like, like, a, like a space of um, scientific hypotheses that, that humans are capable of you know, explore, and uh, it's pretty much small, like, uh, small, it, it, small amount of this space was, dis was explored so far, and probably humans are not capable to explore, like, uh, uh, entire space, so that's the opportunity for AI probably, right? And he makes the argument that they yeah, look at this um, AlphaGo system, which was at this time probably, uh, so yeah, it's like an, uh, an example. And another one is this kind of basic idea that um, um, we should go through kind of, um, the, the flow here is like two, 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 two different things. One thing is more like the thing that which is called now cloud labs probably. It's like uh, kind of automated laboratories that you can access like uh, uh, anywhere uh, uh, through like, you know, programmatically. And uh, another one is some kind of assistance or transition, tr like you, you don't go to the AI scientist right away, but you have some kind of transition state of like some kind of assistant, which we call co-pilots right now in lots of other domains. So they kind of help the scientists to uh, achieve their task, and then, in a huge leap of you know engineering like genius and something like that, we will finally solve the problem. So that's like the roadmap. 
Um, that was his idea. Um, and, um, and I would argue, so if you look at the what happened next, that's just one slide. It, like we have like enabler, some, some kind of technology that kind of you know brings like life to this idea. Uh, and then you can see several like applications be beginning just like recently. You know, like at the end of the previous year and right now, like probably every month something is kind of some somebody is throwing something. Uh, in, in scientific papers, but also in, like, you can see that in companies' products, and it's, it's beginning to emerge. So, and just, I will uh, go through some cases of that. So, for, uh, first case is like, it's called co-scientist. So, it's uh, academic work, so people, they, they just, uh, ha they also have some kind of lab, which, which is integrated with the uh, software system. And the software system looks like a, basically, multi-agent system you have like a planner, which is you can call orchestrator. So this is the guy who kind of like decides what to do. And this guy uh, is uh, has access to different tools. They just give him access through simple things like providing him a documentation of these tools, for example. Because this is a generative AI LLM systems. You can throw some knowledge into them and they kind of hopefully they will learn something about the tool, so they just created this agent. They uh, have like web search tool, reading documents, execute code, and yeah, basically connect to the um, lab uh, equipment. Uh, and uh, they just you know, created this thing, and okay, let's see what's gonna happen. Uh, yeah, and they showed that it can also, as this kind of atom uh, example before you can go through the whole cycle of scientific like experimentation, hypothesis generation, and achieve results for uh, I guess some like compound uh, optimization or something. So yeah, that's that's an example. Another example would be a company which is called Future House. It's like uh, a philanthropically funded thing. So. They have a challenge, okay, in 10 years we will, be, we will build this AI scientist, and the first tool that they provide is basically like a literature research, okay, we have a question of uh, something, how do plants communicate or something, and then the system just goes, reviews lots of papers on the internet, and kind of summarizes it in some kind of Wikipedia page. So, um, another example would be Chemcro, is a system also like a, a academic, so they, they also created an agent, which is a LLM agent, which is capable of some complex reasoning, uh, and uh, just throw like 18 or something tools to this agent. Like this agent can, you know, map some different concepts. It can literature search, web search, code, uh, like stuff like that, uh, uh, and also achieve results. And uh, another application would be. This is even more like because recursion AI is like like a tech, tech bio leader probably like like in AI driven uh, drug development one of the, those companies and y you can search you can you can see that those companies are beginning to even like create and cr create like products which are like pretty mature uh, and. Uh, you could see like LLM orchestrated workflow engine. That's the, like exactly the thing which I was talking about, like when you have to uh, orchestrate complex processes with lots of tasks with LLMs. So that's actually the end. And I mean, the video is great. Uh, I know maybe I don't have time to show it like a couple of minutes, but yeah, anyway. So um, I would finish with like some kind of vision of future, which I missed here, but the idea is that um, I feel that every biotechnology company would be some kind of like information company. So all the physical uh, work would be outsourced to some cloud labs. You don't have to do this. And uh, you, can, you can run companies basically with small amount of people who are interacting with some kind of LLM agent. Uh, they are just like embedded in this. They are doing only science, you know, not doing this kind of shitty work of like, you know, pushing, you know, tables from one place to another, like, so they're doing science, uh, and this orchestrator kind of under the hood, 
does a lot of work, like, like, like search web, do research, orders, you know, compounds like logistics, runs experiments and things like that. So with finishing, there's like generative AI as a, just a tool and that's great, amazing, but there's also generative AI as a way to automate the company like overall, you know, it's like, it's like a different aspect and uh, probably by creating those systems, we can accelerate the scientific discovery uh, tremendously.